The man who we call the last great madrigalist, the first great opera composer, Claudio Monteverdi, 1567 to 1643. He provides our bridge from the Renaissance to the Baroque. Baroque, excuse me. Great madrigalist and also the first great opera composer. Of course, Italian. The first great opera, 1607. 1607. And the name of that opera was Orfeo. Orfeo. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Three of Monteverdi's 12 operas have been preserved. Uh, so we do know his output was extensive. Um, he worked for the court of Mantua. He worked uh, for St. Mark's Cathedral, and his um, musical style is one of great emotional intensity and very radical for its time. Experimentation with dissonance, new orchestral effects, and used a very large orchestra at times. Orfeo, he used 44 instruments in the pit. This is 1607, and a lot of special effects to go along with it. The first production of Orfeo was for the Mantuan court, and this was a very lavish production, of course. And what Monteverdi did so beautifully uh, is makes his characters come alive uh, with, of course, beautiful music, but also ensemble work, right? We talked about the idea of an ensemble. Um, and through the vocal line, we can hear Orfeo's, the hero's despair, and we can also hear his joy. And just a little bit about the plot. First of all, uh, these early Baroque, op Baroque operas often mythological. And so, again, we're going back to that idea of, of Greece and Rome, right? Does anybody know where Orfeo comes from? What am I talking about here? Orpheus, right? Orpheus in the underworld? Orpheus, right? Orpheus. No? Nobody's, nobody has any clue at all. Do you? Huh? No? No. Okay. Well, a little bit about um, the plot. First of all, Orpheus, the supremely, supremely gifted musician of uh, Greek myth, um, he was the son of the god Apollo, you see. And at the beginning of the opera, he's, and of course, this is making a very, very long story, very, very short. Okay, because these operas are very long and they have so many characters. Um, I can't even go into it. We'd have to spend an entire semester on it. Apollo is ecstatically happy after his marriage to Eurydice. Okay, he's, he's very happy about that. And I, I can't say I would blame him. But his joy is shattered when she's killed by a poisonous snake. Orpheus goes down to Hades. Where's that? Yeah, you go to Monet and go left. What? <laughs> what? It's the underworld, which is what? Which is what? Help. Help. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Looking for that word. All right. So what he does is he goes down to hell and he tries to get her back. And so the gods say, okay, you can go down and get her. But when you bring her back up, you can't look at her. You can't turn around and look at her. And so what does he do? Turns around and looks at her. And unfortunately, Eurydice vanishes. Nonetheless, there is a happy ending of sorts. Apollo pities Orpheus and brings him to heaven where he can gaze eternally at Eurydice's radiance in the sun and stars. Okay. Now remember the first class, right? <coughs> Much more complex, okay? We got to get it started here, you know, four hours of, of this with characters coming in and out and in and out. But this was a lavish production and it was well suited for what it was, okay? And Monteverdi is responsible for that first opera or fail, okay? And so as we uh, go along, please remember these characteristics of Baroque opera. Um, I'm going to play you a uh, recitative 
from Orfeo. And uh, I will read you the text before I do it. You are dead, you are dead, my dearest. And I breathe, you have left me. You have left me forevermore, never to return, and I remain. No, no, if my verses have any power, I will go confidently to the deepest abysses and, having melted the heart of the king of the shadows, will bring you back to see me and the stars again. Or, if piteous, pitiless fate denies me this, I will remain with you in the company of death. Farewell, earth, farewell, sky, and sun, farewell. Okay? And so, this is really... Um, a mastery of this then very, very novel technique called the recitative. And listen to what is going on um, behind it, because it's only accompanied by a small portable type organ and a bass lute. So there really isn't a lot of accompaniment. Recitatives should not have a lot of accompaniment, because then you won't hear the words. And that's what they're for. Okay? This is You Are Dead from Orfeo. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sir, how can you not like opera after that? Adio. Still not doing anything. All right, give me another chance. Okay. Now, we're going to skip up a little bit in the Baroque period and uh, talk about an English composer because we won't really talk about an English composer again because England's going to fall off the face of the earth. Um, musically speaking, and his name is Henry Purcell. And he was a very prolific composer. 1659 to 1695, we lost him very early, and in this class I'm going to say that a lot about a lot of composers. Um, he was called one of the greatest English composers of all time. Born in London, um, uh, the age of 10, he was a choir boy, a very, very typical musical life, became a composer to the King's String Orchestra, and two years later appointed organist at Westminster's Abbey, Westminster Abbey. During the years of his short life, he was also an active composer of, of, of music for plays and also um, opera. And he was the last native com English composer of international rank until the 20th century. How weird is that? You know, we really aren't going to go there at all until uh, maybe the very last week of this course. He mastered all musical forms of the late 17th century. Everything, church music, secular choral music, music for small groups of instruments, songs, music for the stage. His only true, true opera, Dido and Aeneas, 1689. Many consider really the finest uh, ever written to an English text. Purcell had a God-given talent of being able to set the English language to music. People, it's very difficult. English is not easy to set to music. Italian rolls off the tongue. It's a, it's a different sound. It's very difficult to set um, English to, uh, uh, especially, certainly, to opera. And we're going to look at this opera very quickly, Dido and Aeneas mainly because he did a lot of interesting things to the development of opera. First of all, he made it shorter. He made it shorter. One of the reasons why he made it shorter was because it was written for a girls' boarding school. Okay? And so these were younger girls who were doing this production. It only lasts about an hour, and it's only scored for strings and harpsichord. Okay? So, most of the uh, solo roles are for women, and there's real no uh, elaborate uh, stage scenery as well. And a lot of dancing, a lot of dancing. Um, the libretto of Dido and Aeneas, you might have already figured, out, figured this out already, uh, it, is fr it is inspired by Virgil's Aeneid, right? Virgil's Aeneid, an epi epic poem. Uh, written, uh, Virgil lived, by the way, between 70 and 19 BC, so we're talking about a real uh, ancient text. 
the main characters, Dido and not the singer. Um, no, she is the singer, I suppose, in this, but you guys know who I'm talking about. Uh, Dido is the queen of Carthage, and Aeneas, the warrior, the Trojan warrior. And he, after the destruction of his native Troy, had been ordered by the gods to seek a new, uh, seek in, uh, building a new city. And so he docks his boat in Carthage. Well, who do you think he falls in love with? Of course, Queen Dido. But you see, what happens is some of Dido's friends, a sorcerer, sorceress and two witches, see this as an opportunity to plot Dido's downfall. A false messenger tells Aeneas that the gods have summoned him elsewhere. And Dido, poor Dido, <laughs> she is so overcome. She kills herself. Does she die of a broken heart, sir, back there? Does she die of a broken heart? Who knows, but she dies. And the greatest part of the opera is just before she dies because she sings the most beautiful aria called When I Am Laid in Earth. And the text is, When I am laid in earth, may my wrongs create no trouble, no trouble in thy breast. Remember me, remember me, but ah, forget my fate. And what Purcell is able to do with those words is absolutely out of this world gorgeous. You're all going to fall off your chairs, right? Of course you are. And this is also the part where the teacher has to say, if you don't feel it, I'm a little concerned. Now, what he's going to do is, remember me, remember me, but I'll forget my fate is going to rise higher and higher. This is a gorgeous melody over a very simple accompaniment. As a matter of fact, the accompaniment is so simple. It's called a ground beef. That's how I used to remember it in college, ground beef. It's called a ground bass, believe it or not. And this ground bass keeps repeating over and over again, and I will play it for you. It goes like this. And then she sings, When I am laid in earth. And it is absolutely incredible that this very simple repetitive bass has an incredible melody over it. just heard about two operas from the Baroque period. One uh, early opera, Orfeo, in 1607, uh, the first complete opera written by Monteverdi. And then we have uh, Henry Purcell's uh, Dido and Aeneas written later on in the Baroque period. Now we go over to um, instrumental music. Uh, we're going to talk about instrumental music, and eventually we're going to talk about uh, uh, choral music as well. Okay. Now, I want to get out of the way talking about the instrumental genres of the Baroque period. Um, basically, what I want you to do is just know them and write them down. And as we talk about each composer, I'm going to add a genre in. In other words, okay, when we talk about Bach, we're going to talk about the fugue. And so, I just want to organize your minds right now. And uh, the instrumental genres we will be touching are the trio sonata, the solo sonata, the accompanied sonata, how's that for diverse styles of composition? We've used the word sonata three times. The concerto, the fugue, and the suite. And I'm leaving out many, okay? So we know we have this boom of instruments, namely the modern looking violin, right? The viola, the cello, the bass, we also know we have the harpsichord as well. And so we're going to talk about our two uh, wonderful Italian instrumental composers, Corelli, 1653 to 1713, and Vivaldi, 1678 to 1741. Two guys that cornered the market on Italian instrumental music. Not only were these guys 
both Corelli and Vivaldi, great violinists in their own right, but they were also teachers of the violin and composers and conductors as well. And so we have the all-around composer, right? He was also the great player as well. We'll talk about that uh, quite a bit. Certainly Mozart was the great pianist, composed great piano concertos. And we'll see uh, Corelli and Vivaldi did so much for the development of string music. Okay, we'll take the older of the two, Corelli. Composer, teacher, and violinist. His output, very small, but works highly admired, especially by Bach. He spent most of his adult life uh, in Rome, uh, and um, he mingled with the intellectual and era, arist aristocratic, I can never say that word, elite uh, of Rome. And he was very, very successful. And as a teacher, he instructed some of the most eminent musicians of his time and laid the foundations for violin technique. Now, what does that mean? Well, Corelli was actually one of the first guys to say, hey, why don't we play two notes at once? Hey, why don't we play short notes with the bow? Why don't we try to play chords? We can do this. And so this modern violin technique, Corelli really contributed quite a bit. And he was a wonderful teacher as well as a wonderful uh, player. And he was very unique about, uh, very different from other composers of the period in that he only wrote instrumental music. Uh, over 60 sonatas and 12 concertos, all for strings. And we're going to talk about those genres in a second. Um, it's interesting, not a lot of, is known about uh, Corelli's personality, uh, but gen basically described as gentle and calm. But I guess there, there are these reports that when he played, when he picked up the violin, and I quote, whilst he was playing on the violin, it was usual for his countenance to be distorted. His eyes become as red as fire, and his eyeballs to roll as in agony. And so he was like this gentle, calm guy, and then he'd just be possessed when he had the violin in his hand. And so with Corelli, I'm going to mention the sonata, the Baroque sonata, okay? Sonata. Specifically, very quickly, One of the main developments of instrumental music was the sonata. And okay, I'm going to give you a very general description. Okay? It was a very important type of chamber music. Here we are, a very important word, chamber music. Two words. Chamber music is music for a small ensemble. Orchestral music is music for an orchestra. And so chamber music thinks small. Okay? And the trio, sonata, was a very important type of Baroque chamber music. Two violins, cello, and harpsichord. Now, you should say to yourself immediately, it's a trio sonata. How many instruments do we have? We have how many? Four. Two violins, cello, and harpsichord. Okay? Um, so, the trio sonata it's kind of an interesting little musical animal. Um, and basically what I want you to know is that it is a form of chamber music. The word sonata okay, is, is a composition that is in several movements. All right, Because we're going to look at the solo sonata, which is one person playing. Okay? And it, it's, just, it's a very, very general term. Okay, we'll see that it's going to take on a more restricted meaning as we grow, but right now it is very, very general. Okay? And so Corelli composed a whole slew of these wonderful uh, trio sonatas, and he also composed for the orchestra as well. And that's very important, that he was not only a chamber music composer, he was also an orchestral composer, and he was also a wonderful violinist, Corelli. Now, what Corelli is going to do is going to pass, he's going to pass on to his students, and he's going to pass on to great composers like Vivaldi. Vivaldi. Antonio Vivaldi.
Antonio Vivaldi, 1678 to 1741, and I'm going to repeat myself. He was a wonderful violinist, probably even better than Corelli because modern violin technique is going to get better and better, therefore you're going to have better players. Okay, he was a composer, a conductor. Um, he was a very, very important figure in the late Baroque. Um, his, he was born in Venice. His father was a violinist at St. Mark's Cathedral. And uh, along with musical training, he prepared for the priesthood. Uh, but Vivaldi really didn't um, do very well in the priesthood. Uh, some, some reports say that he had poor health, and that's why he had to leave the ministry. But a lot of people say that this guy just absolutely faked it. When it was his turn to go uh, speak in front of people at church, he'd have an asthma attack. But then he'd go back there and start composing immediately. So nobody really knows if he was just in absolutely poor health, and, and that's why uh, he uh, left, the priest, uh, left the priesthood. But um, he had red hair, and that's how I always remembered Vivaldi. We called him El Prete Rosso, the red-haired priest. Red hair. Isn't that an interesting thing? Aren't you glad you paid money to take this course? Vivaldi had red hair. What's so interesting about him is that he worked for a music school of the Pietà. And what he did was very interesting and very, very admirable. The Pietà was an institution for orphaned and illegitimate girls. And what he did was, he took these youngsters and he made them incredible musicians. He had one of the most famous orchestras in all of Italy. And when you have a great orchestra with people who really can play in front of you, if you're a composer, you're really lucky because you're going to get every ounce of experiment out of your music. And that's exactly what happened. Again, this was one of the most famous orchestras and um, People absolutely loved it. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Vivaldi's popularity waned uh, just before his death. But in the 1950s, we had this Baroque revival, and it still exists today. People like to go out and buy Vivaldi because of uh, many, many reasons, but because of its energy, because of its melody. It is very, and I'm going to throw this word out now, it's very romantic music. It's very beautiful, beautiful music of Antonio Vivaldi. We have incredible, incredibly vigorous rhythms and impassioned lyricism. Uh, Vivaldi actually composed operas. Couldn't bring up a one for you right now. Aren't you glad back there, sir? Um, yes, he's smiling from ear to ear. We don't have to listen to a Vivaldi opera. I'm kind of glad about that, too, if you want to know the truth. Um, he is best known for his 450 solo concerti and concerto grossi, OK? And we're going to talk about Vivaldi in relation to the concerto, okay? And a concerto is a piece for soloists and orchestra. A concerto is a piece for soloist and orchestra. usually in three movements, and it alternates in tempo. The first movement, fast, the second movement, slow, and the last movement, fast, end with a bang, standing ovation, yahoo, right? It is a way for a great player to ham it up. And Vivaldi had those available to him. And so you have one person standing in front of the orchestra, maybe playing a flute, maybe playing a violin, maybe even a harpsichord, concerto but it was a way to display the virtuosos of the day, right? The people who would really play could stand up and play a concerto. And again, you're playing alone with the orchestra. And it's very important because we're going to follow this genre as well, all the way up to the 20th century. It, a lot of what the groundwork in the Baroque musically, especially in, in instrumental music, we're gonna, we still see now. And the concerto is the most excellent example I can give you in something that's still written today. And there's a reason why. And again, it's because it's to showcase an instrument. Now, everybody's favorite piece by Vivaldi, The Four Seasons. Did you know that it's four? It's a piece that contains four individual violin concertos. You can play one. You can just play spring. You can just play fall. You can just play summer. But it's much better to hear them all at once. They are very difficult. Vivaldi expanded 
the violin technique where, boy, any professional player nowadays is, is going to have some problems with it. It's very difficult. It's very fast at times. It's very expressive at times. You need all your faculties to be able to play it. But it is a series of four different violin concertis. And did you know that Vivaldi composed sonnets to go with it? Now, they are not of the greatest literary quality, but they exist. And so for that spring concerto, spring is come and joyfully, the birds greet it with a happy song, and the streams fanned by gentle breezes flow along with a sweet murmur, covering the sky with a black cloak. Thunder and lightning come to announce the season. When these have quieted down, the little birds return to their enchanted song. Now, answer me this. Why did Vivaldi use the genre of the violin concerto? to write a piece about the Four Seasons. That has always fascinated me. Why didn't he use a choir? I mean, he could write vocal music. Why? He used the violin. And this, these are incredible, incredible masterpieces and way ahead of their time, way ahead of their time. It's a piece of programmatic music. I'm not going to talk about programmatic music until we get to the Romantic period. This is programmatic. Programmatic means that we have a non-musical idea going with something musical. The non-musical here, the seasons. And so what he will give you is ice, the falling leaves, the river. It's amazing, OK? We're going to listen to the first movement, the first movement of the spring concerto. In the beginning, you're actually going to hear the birds. And that's exactly what he's saying. The birds greet it with their happy song, OK? But please notice the solo part. Very difficult uh, and, and very, very fast. Also, notice the vivacious rhythms. That's one of the reasons why we're so attracted to Vivaldi is because of what he does with uh, rhythm and what he does with lyricism. When I was eight years old, I can remember uh, one of the concertos, da di um bum ba di um bum ba di um bum beam. I was a little kid, and I remembered that. And so we now have melodies that just are going to stick in our brains. Vivaldi, spring concerto, first movement. Okay, so we have looked at uh, some instrumental music now of the Baroque period. And the next time we get together, we will look at the two giants of the Baroque and spend a lot of time talking about their instrumental music and their vocal music, J.S. Bach and George Frederick Handel.